In 1963, detectives investigated the murder of a woman in California. But it would take technology almost 30 years to catch up with the killer. A trash bag is the only clue detectives have to the identity of a serial killer. So far, their search has met only with failure. But a new fingerprint technology will give them one last chance to put the killer away. In a murder investigation in Vermont, police have their suspect. Now all they need is solid evidence to convict him. The case hinges on a bloody but distorted palm print on the murder weapon. In cases that look all but hopeless, science finds a solution in the telltale marks of the killer's death grip. In 1985, a serial killer was on the loose in San Diego, California. The killer targeted prostitutes and other women. He'd rape and murder them, then discard their bodies in trash dumpsters. To catch him, police needed to identify his fingerprints, which proved to be elusive. On the morning of May 9, 1986, police responded to a call from a woman who came upon a ghastly sight as she was taking out her garbage, the killer's latest victim. When they arrived, they saw a sight that had become all too familiar, a body in a dumpster. This time, the murderer had wrapped it in two garbage bags joined with masking tape. After disposing of the body in the dumpster, he covered it with a blanket. Police questioned neighbors to find out if they'd seen anyone suspicious. No one had seen anything out of the ordinary. Homicide detectives came to the scene to investigate. An emergency unit arrived to retrieve the body. The victim was identified as Joanne Sweets, a prostitute. She had been raped and strangled to death, and several of her ribs were broken. That was the serial killer's calling card. Would the killer elude police again? It was going to be a tough case to crack. Since most of the victims were prostitutes, the murders weren't always reported, or the few eyewitnesses were unreliable. But this time, the detectives were able to lift a fingerprint from the dumpster. Detective Dan Hatfield was part of a task force formed to stop the horrid wave of killings before it went any further. Primarily, uh, the whole focus of the, uh, the task force was to look into uh, women, primarily prostitutes, that. Uh, had uh, been found murdered here in the city of San Diego and also in the county. There was approximately 35 to 40 unsolved cases. The Joanne Sweets case was the latest. With any luck, it would be the last. Detectives believe the killer lived or worked in the neighborhood. Two other prostitutes' bodies had also been discovered in dumpsters nearby. We had Tara Simpson that was found in, the, uh, in another dumpster that's adjacent to, uh, to the Joanne Sweets case. Uh, the dumpster was located at the T of the, uh, the alley. Um, the early morning hours, the uh, police were called here. Uh, they found the uh, garbage container fully engulfed. Fire department finds that there's a female in there and she is badly burned. A lot of the evidence was lost because of the, uh, the fact that she was badly burned. Several months after, Tara Simpson's uh, body was found here. We go up several blocks up the same alleyway um, at another dumpster was uh, found the body of Trina Carpenter. 
Trina Carpenter uh, had also been manually strangled. Um, she was wrapped in a uh, green duffel bag at that time. Hatfield was sure the same man was behind the deaths of all the women. But the investigation turned up no suspects. A manual search of fingerprints in police files failed to match the print found on the dumpster where Sweet's body was found. Whoever left the print didn't have a criminal record. The case went unsolved. Three years later, fingerprint expert Diane Donnelly joined the task force to work on the Joanne Sweets case. I was brought in on this case in 1989 at the request of homicide and this is one of the cases that they had asked to go back and re-examine some of the evidence to see if there was anything else we could do at this point. She learned that fingerprint experts had already tried using a chemical called gentian violet to lift prints from the masking tape that held the garbage bags around the body. The process can expose fingerprints left on sticky surfaces. When a finger touches the adhesive side of tape and is removed, skin cells remain behind. The gentian violet stains those cells, revealing the print. Experts repeated the process over and over, but couldn't raise a single print. Then, shortly after Donnelly joined the task force, she and San Diego detectives received a break. They decided to make another attempt to identify the print from the dumpster using a new computerized fingerprint matching system. Several suspects were considered and dismissed before a match was made. The prints belonged to a man named Brian Maurice Jones. At the time of the San Diego murders, he'd never been arrested. Since then, Jones had been convicted for rape, robbery, and kidnapping a prostitute. He became the prime suspect in the murder of Joanne Sweets. But detectives knew the print from the dumpster wasn't enough to make a case. Jones would have an alibi. His mother lived in a building adjacent to the alley where Sweet's body had been found. And of course you could logically assume that his defense would be that he had taken out his mother's trash. So we needed something more concrete, that proverbial nail in the coffin, to link him to this murder and maybe some of the other murders of the, of, of the women in San Diego. Even without a print, Dan Hatfield had a strong hunch that Jones had murdered Joanne Sweets and the others. According to Hatfield's scenario, Jones most likely cruised the boulevard looking for victims. He'd pick a prostitute and take her to his mother's apartment while she was at work. He'd act like a typical client, but the evening would culminate in murder. Afterward, he'd wrap the body up and take it out to the dumpster, like he was taking out the trash. Jones was still in prison for lesser crimes, but he'd be eligible for parole in 10 years. If Hatfield could link him to the Joanne Sweets murder, he'd make sure Jones would never get out. I believe when Mr. Jones dumped Joanne Sweets body in the dumpster, he probably felt he could get away with it since he got away with the other two murders. In their effort to prove Jones's guilt, the detectives would pin their hopes on the latest method of fingerprint technology. Stalled for three years, the murder investigation of Joanne Sweets got a jump start in 1992. Detectives once again focused on the garbage bags the killer used to wrap his victim. Six years earlier, no prints were found on the bags. But Dan Hatfield and Diane Donnelly were sure the prints were there. <laughs> 
At the time that I was investigating these cases, it was my feeling that there were in fact latent prints on the garbage bags. We were just not using the right technique. I checked around, I talked with the FBI. What they told me is that there was a technique that was being used in England and also in Canada with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, a technique called vacuum metal deposition. At which point I called Canada I found out that they were in fact using this technique to lift latent prints from uh, plastics and that they were more than happy to do our case. Donnelly took the evidence to the laboratories of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Ottawa. She was hopeful, but the prints were six years old. Would they have degraded too much for the process to work? They were more than willing and happy to assist me in this matter, but they were not too optimistic about obtaining any identifiable latent prints. The process, known as vacuum metal deposition, was developed in the U.S., but most jurisdictions don't have the money to utilize it. It's used more widely in Europe and Canada. Its main application is on plastics. But for fingerprint expert Pat Laternus of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, it's a versatile process that works when all other techniques have failed. Uh, it's possible to get fingerprints on things like magazine paper, uh, paper towel, uh, tissue, very fine uh, uh, exhibits. Uh, it has a limited application in some of those things, but really, when there's no other way to do it, and it works. Uh, if we take uh, uh, the best exhibit, the uh, uh, solid plastic type of exhibit, it's a matter of keeping that clean and then placing it inside the work holder of the chamber. Handling the evidence carefully, Laternus places it in the chamber. A few milligrams of gold are deposited on a heating element. Once the chamber is sealed, pumps create a vacuum. Once it's within a vacuum, the gold source is heated and that heat is melting the metal. The metal would almost liquefy, boil, and then uh, you can compare it to steam where it, where it would go straight up and condense it on the surface that it hits. A thin, invisible layer coats the plastic surface of the garbage bag. If the bag contains no fingerprints, the layer of gold will be uniform. But if fingerprints are present, the gold will sink into them, leaving the oily ridges of the print uncoated. The process is then repeated with a few milligrams of zinc. Like the gold, the zinc vaporizes within the evidence chamber. It will recondense only onto other metals, so it will only cling to the previous layer of gold. But the zinc won't stick on the oily residue of the fingerprint where there's no gold. The result is a high contrast fingerprint. The bags were removed from the chamber and inspected. This moment would make or break the case against Jones. After six years in hiding, the prints on the bags finally became visible. And with them, a dead-end case cleared a major roadblock. We knew this exhibit was six years old. We knew it was involved in a homicide, which made it a high-profile case. And uh, it was quite exciting to see the latent when we pulled it out of the chamber. The latent prints found on the garbage bags matched the prints of Brian Maurice Jones. The vacuum metal deposition process enabled Hatfield and Donnelly to connect him to the murder. The nail in the casket were in fact the latent prints that were taken from the garbage bags and that came back matching Brian Jones without a doubt. Um, there was no way for him to disprove the fact that these were somebody else's prints. Um, that was a nail in the coffin as far as I'm concerned. In 1996, the state of California tried Brian Maurice Jones for the murder of Joanne Sweets and several related crimes. 
he was convicted and sentenced to death. Advances in the science of fingerprint detection had solved a case that seemed all but hopeless. Uh, I feel very good about it, the fact that even though these victims were prostitutes, they were people also. And I think with his conviction, I believe that they had their day in court and justice was served. The vacuum deposition process raised Brian Jones's fingerprints and secured his conviction. But it was a computer that first singled him out. In another California case, detectives used computer technology to pursue a killer across three decades. On October 2nd, 1963, Thora Rose was spending a quiet evening alone in her apartment in Hollywood, California. She had rented the apartment just a month earlier after separating from her husband and was slowly adjusting to life on her own. Rose worked as a waitress and kept mainly to herself in her free time. The ground floor apartment was considered to be in a safe neighborhood even for a woman who lived alone. But that night, someone invaded that safety, and Thora Rose became his target. He waited in the darkness as she settled in for the evening. When her lights went out, he made his move. As Rose drifted off to sleep, he pried open a window over the kitchen sink and crawled into her apartment. Once inside, he slipped through the kitchen and crept toward the bedroom. When he got there, he attacked. After a violent struggle, Thora Rose, age 43, was dead. When Rose failed to come to work the next day, her employer telephoned her, but got no response. Concerned, he called the police. When they arrived, they found Thora Rose's body in the bedroom. Police questioned neighbors, but no one had seen anyone enter or leave Rose's apartment. Nobody heard a thing. It was one of the worst crimes the quiet Hollywood neighborhood had ever experienced. Almost 35 years later, Los Angeles police detective Mike McDonough visits the scene of the crime. Hollywood back then was a, a completely different place as it is today. I mean, when you think Hollywood back in 63, it was still the, the movie industry, um, still a lot of single family uh, residences here, a couple of apartment buildings, um, completely different world. The crime rate was practically nothing to compare to what it is to today. Hollywood now, we're averaging anywhere from 50 to 60 homicides a year. Back in 1963, they had four. The murder caused a major stir. The homicide division of the Los Angeles Police Department gave the case top priority. At first, just two detectives were assigned to the case, but the number quickly rose to six. Eventually, 32 uniformed officers and two sergeants joined the investigation. They canvassed the neighborhood for a suspect. Inside the apartment, Experts dusted for fingerprints. 
There was palm, palm prints and fingerprints inside the kitchen and throughout the house. Um, There's approximately 27 fingerprints that were lifted inside the residence leading from the front window here into the bedroom. The police officers working the neighborhood found nothing. It was up to the fingerprint experts alone to solve the case. With the long trail of fingerprints left behind, the detectives were certain they would catch the murderer. Their confidence was well-founded. For more than 100 years, fingerprinting has proven to be one of the most effective ways to pin criminals to crimes. The science goes back to 1880, when Scottish physician Henry Falls suggested that ridge patterns on the fingers and hands could be useful in identifying criminals. In 1901, Scotland Yard adopted the idea, and the rest of the world soon followed. Fingerprinting works for two reasons. First, no two people share print patterns. And second, a person's fingerprints remain unchanged throughout life. The skin of human fingers and hands have raised patterns called friction ridges, which help us grip objects more firmly. They're constantly coated with a film of perspiration from tiny pores. The curves, loops, and other characteristics of the ridges can occur in billions of combinations. At a crime scene, the perpetrator may leave noticeable prints if he touched blood, grease, or another dark substance. If he touched something soft, like putty, the fingerprints may be impressed on its surface. But the majority of fingerprints are invisible, known as latent fingerprints. They're made of about 98% perspiration and 2% body oil. We leave them on virtually everything we touch. Like film in a camera, they must be developed to be seen. The fingerprint experts at Los Angeles Police Department's fingerprint lab have long relied on powders to make latent prints visible. It's been one of the most common and effective methods since fingerprinting began. When lightly applied with a camel hair brush, powder adheres to the moisture in the fingerprint, providing a finely detailed image. The detective then lifts the print using a strip of clear tape and places it on a card with his initials, the time, date, and location of the print. This detailed information is vital if the print will be used as evidence in court. After the fingerprint experts working on the Thora Rose case lifted the finger and palm prints from her Hollywood apartment, they had to prove they belonged to the perpetrator. There's always a possibility they could belong to someone else. Detectives obtained what are called elimination prints from everyone who had contact with Thora Rose. They were able to contact those people, the uh, restaurants, places she worked, they fingerprinted everyone that was there. They also went as far as local delivery boys, as far as serving, delivering chicken, mail people, um, newspaper people. Anyone that had any contact with this place, they checked out. After all other persons were eliminated, detectives drew the only possible conclusion. The prints belonged to the killer. Now they could be sent to the lab to be compared by fingerprint examiners to prints of criminals in their files. Whenever police make an arrest for even the smallest infraction, they require the arrested person to be fingerprinted. The prints are kept on file and in some cases sent to other police jurisdictions. If the suspect is ever involved in another crime, his prints will be available for comparison. The traditional way of recording fingerprints is the ink and roll method. Each finger is rolled on an ink pad, then impressed on a card with the arrested person's name and personal data. The document is then added to the fingerprint files. Recently, some jurisdictions have begun scanning fingerprints into a computer. The scanner creates a digital image of the prints so they can be added to the database. A beam of light replaces the ink pad. Either way, the matching process begins 
when the examiner compares prints from the crime scene with prints from police files. Comparing fingerprints is much the same today as in 1963. The examiner must look for matching points of identification. The friction ridges arrange themselves into arches, loops, and whorls. Sometimes they end abruptly. Sometimes they split in two. The examiner considers all these patterns when making an identification. If enough of them match, then he can be certain he's looking at the prints of the same person. In the Thora Rose case, Los Angeles detectives reviewed all the fingerprints in their files. When none matched, they sent a detective to the state capitol in Sacramento to expand the search statewide. He scoured every file, looking at a staggering 30,000 fingerprints. The labor took months, but still nothing matched. I mean, it, it's a point that they, they put in an unbelievable man hours of time on this case. And um, even with all that they have done, which is probably thousands and thousands of percent more than what we could do today with our crimes, they still weren't able to come up with anything. Even though the killer had left behind many fingerprints, the detectives couldn't match them to anyone with a police record. The case was unsolved. The files were shelved, and the murderer of Thora Rose went free. Thirty years would pass before time and technology would flush him out. Three decades after the murder of Thora Rose, a new computerized system of fingerprint comparison went online. The Automated Fingerprint Identification System, or APHIS, promised to revolutionize the field of fingerprint identification. It matches prints in a fraction of the time it took using the old method. Fingerprint examiner Donald Keir was one of the first at the Los Angeles Police Department to put APHIS to use. This fingerprint system um, it takes a time to get used to. It was new. It takes time to realize it, and we had a lot of crimes to solve. Keir and his colleagues first used APHIS to match prints collected from current crimes against those in APHIS's files. Then they tried an experiment to see if the system could solve old cases by matching previously unmatched prints. They chose 50 old homicide cases to test. Could APHIS breathe new life into dead cases? To find out, Keir went to the archives in the basement of the police department. There, under the dust of 30 years or more, stood shelves brimming with old fingerprint files. They were gathered from all manner of crimes. Some solved, some not. One of the files he pulled contained prints from the Thora Rose murder. It was the oldest case selected. The chance of finding a suspect after almost 30 years seemed remote. But with millions of prints added to police files since 1963, and the ability of the APHIS system to compare them at lightning speed, detectives had a glimmer of hope. But first, the prints from the Rose case had to be prepared. Before APHIS can recognize any fingerprint, an examiner must photograph it at five times its normal size. In contrast to prints taken from a suspect at the police station, the ridges and patterns of most prints from a crime scene are faint and indistinct. The examiner must carefully enhance the pattern on tracing paper. Otherwise, the computer scanner will be unable to read it. Any place where I'm looping it off is where a ridge in the fingerprint pattern ends. And we want to make sure those are really clear because that's what the computer uses for a search. They're called minutia or characteristics. I check it frequently to see if I'm missing anything, go back over what I've been doing here. Where the latent print is unreadable, 
the examiner must hazard a guess as to line and detail. The tracing is scanned into the computer. The examiner cleans up any indistinct lines on the screen and identifies notable characteristics of the latent print. The computer will use these as a frame of reference. APHIS then begins the matching process. The computer looks at several areas of the unknown print. It then compares these points against prints in its database. It ranks each print according to how closely it matches the unknown print. In another room, the massive APHIS mainframe searches through millions of digitized fingerprints looking for a match. In less than an hour, it completes a job that would ordinarily take months. Then, the system delivers the closest matches. But it's up to the examiner to make the final match by eye. The prints identified by APHIS are compared side by side with the suspect's print. There can be a lot of things that match, but if you're, there's something that you know is pretty obviously a real minutia point, like this one was a pretty pretty big one right here, a little short, short line. And it looks like that might be it there, but over next to it was a place where another ridge ended. There's nothing like that over here. So I would probably disregard that one. The APHIS system has had remarkable results. During its first year of operation, San Francisco police were able to clear 816 unsolved cases, including 52 homicides. Los Angeles police hoped for similar success with their unsolved cases. They weren't disappointed. Soon after they entered the fingerprints from the Thora Rose case, APHIS made a hit. The computer produced three suspects, among them a man named Vernon Robinson. In 1963, Robinson hadn't been arrested, so his fingerprints weren't on file but he'd been arrested a number of times since then, so his prints were part of police records. Detectives using APHIS fingered him as a suspect. Detective Mike McDonough headed the new investigation. Uh, my main concern was to see if Mr. Robinson should have been there or not. I wanted to make sure that he wasn't uh, one of the detectives or a police officer at the scene, he wasn't a paramedic or that he wasn't for some reason a friend of Miss Robinson's, that fingerprints just happened to be there. When all other possibilities were eliminated, McDonough concluded that Robinson was the likely killer of Thora Rose. With that, our fingerprint people obtained the additional fingerprints, started hand searching them, physically checking the fingerprints from the crime scene against Mr. Robinson's prints, and everyone is coming right back to Mr. Robinson. I mean, at this point, there was no doubt about it. Los Angeles police tracked Robinson to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where he was now a family man with a management job in a maintenance company. He denied committing the crime, insisting that at the time of the murder, he was in San Diego at the naval base where he was stationed. But naval records indicated Robinson had completed his training by the date of the murder. His alibi was without support. Well, what swayed the jury was, I mean, the fingerprints are there. You cannot deny that. I mean, we're not talking one or two fingerprints. We're talking 20-some fingerprints. We're talking them at the point of entry through the entire house and right up to where the victim was discovered. After killing Thora Rose, Vernon Robinson managed to evade capture for almost 30 years. His life had changed, but his fingerprints remained the same. After they were matched with those from the crime scene, Robinson was convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. APHIS, a phenomenal breakthrough in criminal identification, had finally obtained justice for Thora Rose. Though APHIS has dramatically improved the chances of matching fingerprints to criminals, it's useless without clear prints to work from. But crime scenes are often messy 
and criminals don't always leave their prints in convenient spots. In a case in Vermont, a murder investigation hinged on two fragile and ill-placed prints, and one investigator's attempt to read them. On Memorial Day, 1992, Glenn Michelson had a party. He and his friends were putting the cold Vermont winter behind them and kicking off the beginning of summer. But the celebration was nearly ruined by an uninvited guest. As the party was winding down, he tried to make off in Michelson's car with one of the kegs of beer. But three of Michelson's buddies caught him in the act. They chased him off the property and retrieved the keg. With the commotion over and the keg emptied, the three men decided to continue celebrating at a nearby tavern. Michelson stayed home. The group returned to the house 45 minutes later, still in high spirits. At first, they didn't notice their host was nowhere in sight. When they called out to him, he didn't answer. They assumed he went to bed. It wasn't until one of the men noticed something peculiar in another room that the horrible truth revealed itself. A ski pole that appeared to be sticking out of the floor was actually embedded in Michelson's skull. They called the Vermont State Police, who rushed to the scene. Michelson's friends couldn't believe the friend they'd laughed with a few hours ago now lay dead. While the police made their report, detectives scoured the house for clues. Their inspection of the brutal crime scene revealed a bloody knife in the kitchen sink. It looked like the victim had been stabbed several times before the ski pole was repeatedly jabbed into his skull. According to Sergeant Miles Heffernan, the victim didn't die easily. He was uh, obviously involved in a struggle, uh, had a, a lot of blood on his clothes. There was a lot of blood on the walls in the hallway. When questioned, the three men who found the body told the detectives about the person who tried to steal Michelson's car and the beer keg. His name was Robert Plant. He'd tagged along with one of the invited guests and grew surly as the evening progressed. The men recalled he wore white shoes with pink laces, the same shoes that were found near the barefoot corpse. The cowboy boots that Michelson had worn were missing. As police continued to investigate, a call came through about a car that had run off the road less than a mile away. A neighbor named Robert Salzman made the report. Mr. Salzman uh, was in the living room with his wife and child and, and heard the car go off the road. He came out and um, observed Robert Plant uh, walking from the vehicle to the uh, front porch of Mr. Salzman's residence. He had a discussion with uh, Robert Plant. Uh, initially, uh, Plant seemed pleasant. He asked if uh, he could get a wrecker, um, and uh, Mr. Salzman was agreeable. But then, Plant became aggressive and broke a window. Salzman threw him off his property and called the police. They arrived within minutes and found the car on the side of the road. It matched the description of Glenn Michelson's vehicle, but Plant was nowhere in sight. Apparently, he fled on foot. Police searched the woods and found him in a short time, passed out under a tree. On his feet were Michelson's cowboy boots. He was taken to the station for questioning and booked for murder. On the surface, it seemed Heffernan had an open and shut case against him. 
But Plant denied the crime, and the police had no eyewitnesses. Theoretically, Plant could claim he had stolen Michelson's property after someone else committed the murder. The detectives would try to bolster their circumstantial case with forensic evidence, Plant's fingerprints. They knew prints lifted from walls, sinks, and drawers had little value since Plant had been a guest at Michelson's party. But they found bloody prints on the grip of the ski pole and on a door frame near the body. If these prints could be identified as Robert Plant's, police would clinch their case. To help him make the identification, Heffernan called on fingerprint expert John Creighton of the Vermont Department of Public Safety's forensic lab. Because the prints were etched in the victim's dried blood, they were extremely incriminating and extremely fragile. Traditional methods of dusting with powder would not be effective. Fortunately, Creighton has a well-stocked arsenal with the means to recover difficult prints. How a print is raised depends on the kind of surface it's on. Uh, basically, there's two different types of evidence that come into the lab for fingerprinting. There's porous and non-porous evidence. Uh, the porous evidence is papers and cardboards and things of that nature, and the non-porous evidence is wood, uh, plastics, metal, glass, things of that nature. Uh, so depending on what type of evidence it is, will dictate what type of examination you do. Paper and other porous surfaces leave no moisture for powders to cling to. One classic method for raising prints from these surfaces is iodine fuming. Iodine crystals are placed inside a glass tube. The tube is then packed with fiberglass and copper sulfate. Breath passing through the crystals heats them, creating fumes. When the fumes reach the fingerprints, the iodine reacts with fatty oils, making them visible. A drawback of this method is that the prints will disappear in about 20 minutes when the iodine evaporates. They must be photographed after fuming, so police will have a record of them. Another way to find fingerprints on paper is to spray the surface with a chemical called ninhydrin. Uh, ninhydrin is a spray or a compound that reacts to amino acids that are present in eccrine and sebaceous sweat deposited latent prints. The ninhydrin is sprayed onto porous material and is then catalyzed or the reaction is catalyzed by applying heat and moisture, uh, generally by means of an iron. Uh, this develops the prints much more quickly. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to set them in the dark and wait uh, anywhere from 24 to possibly 72 hours for any latent impressions to develop that way. Because the amino acids in fingerprints take a long time to disappear, ninhydrin has been used to develop latent prints as old as 15 years. Superglue has also become a staple of fingerprint examiners. Technically called cyanoacrylate ester, it's used on non-porous surfaces, like plastic, where fragile prints could be easily brushed away when powders are applied. Superglue is often used for developing prints inside a car. The glue is poured into a small container and heated. The car is closed up tightly. As the glue is heated, its fumes adhere to the moisture in latent fingerprints and fixes them in place. The examiner can then use traditional powders without the danger of destroying the print. The Glenn Michelson case posed a different set of problems. The bloody thumbprint on the doorframe near the victim's body was barely visible and too delicate to lift. Creighton asked detectives to remove the section of door frame bearing the print and send it to him so he could examine it in a more controlled environment. Creighton's job was to make the print on the door frame distinct without ruining it. 
he could then compare it with Robert Plant's. First, he took photographs, so he would have a record of the evidence before the procedure. Items of evidence are photographed uh, before any physical or chemical development uh, takes place in order to recover and preserve any existing latent detail that is present on the item. Uh, afterwards, uh, then we can do the various processes that are applied to developing the latent impression on that item. Creighton sprayed the door frame with a stain called amido black. The chemical reacts with blood, darkening the print and making it easier to identify. The amido black is a protein stain. It stains the protein that is within the blood itself. So when the ridges or the outline of the impression on the finger is deposited in the blood, the amido black is going to make that impression darker. Uh, it allows it to have more contrast uh, with the background. Bloody fingerprints are very fragile in most cases, so they can't be lifted with tape without destroying them, even after they're developed with amido. Instead, Creighton photographed the enhanced print. When he compared it to plants, it matched. But Plant could have touched the blood-stained doorframe after someone else committed the crime. And the evidence against Plant must convince a jury of his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The irrefutable evidence in the murder of Glenn Michelson had yet to be processed. Glenn Michelson had been the victim of a callous murder, a ski pole driven through his skull. Robert Plant was the prime suspect, but could detectives tie him to the crime? The answer rested on a bloody palm print left on the grip of the weapon. To identify the print, John Creighton needed to photograph it. First, he'd have to make it more visible. That was easier said than done. Uh, the big dilemma was it was a black ski pole grip and it was a dark reddish brown blood impression that was deposited on that. Now what I had to do was I had to improve the contrast either by lightening the background of the black ski pole grip or by um, lightening the blood impression itself. Creighton lit the print with a poly light, a lamp that can project a wide spectrum of wavelengths. The light produced enough contrast to photograph the print. But Creighton faced a second problem. The curvature of the grip prevented the camera lens from keeping the entire print in focus. I had to keep rotating the ski pole grip in order to come up with enough characteristics within the pattern area or within the latent impression that would give me enough information to make an identification. By manipulating the grip, Creighton was able to get a clear photograph of the print. After it was processed, he compared the print to plants. It matched. Creighton had placed the murder weapon firmly in Plant's hand. The events of Glenn Michelson's final hours now made sense. Detectives believed that after being kicked off Michelson's property, Plant hid in the darkness and waited for an opportunity to sneak back into the house. Once the guests had left, he saw his chance and made his move. He slipped into the kitchen and rummaged around until he found a knife. As he stepped into the hallway, Michelson spotted him. The two men struggled, but Plant had the fatal advantage. He stabbed Michelson repeatedly until he brought the victim down. He removed Michelson's boots and put them on his own feet 
Then he realized his victim wasn't dead. So he found a ski pole in another room and returned to finish him off. As he thrust the pole, he put his hand on the doorframe for support. After the final blow, he left the house, stealing Michelson's car for his getaway. But he only made it about a mile before he ran off the road. The bloody prints that Creighton analyzed gave Detective Miles Heffernan the evidence he needed to convict Robert Plant. It was very compelling, uh, very compelling for a jury when they hard to explain or, or explain away. You've got your thumbprint uh, in the victim's blood on the door molding, and you've got the handprint on the murder weapon. Uh, it tells a story right there. For the murder of Glenn Michelson, Robert Plant received a sentence of 50 years to life. For more than a century, fingerprints have proven themselves a reliable and irrefutable way to link criminals to their crimes. In the next century, their role will increase as scientists improve ways to recover them. More and more, killers will be delivered into the arms of justice by their own hands. A Cleveland woman is killed in her home. Can 40-year-old evidence absolve a dead man of guilt? A stormy argument ends with a gunshot. To investigators, the situation screams murder until years later, when forensics throws new light on it. Two homicides, one suspect. But the evidence needed to make the case was buried long ago. Will an exhumation put the final nail in the killer's coffin? At a murder scene, police must wring the full meaning from every available clue. But when the evidence is inadequate, detectives must return to the victim to make their grave discoveries. In 1998, a breakthrough in DNA analysis helped solve a 40-year-old murder case. At sunrise on the morning of July 4, 1954, Dr. Sam Shepard slowly came to on the Bay Village, Ohio shore of Lake Erie. The events of the pre-dawn hours flooded back to him like a nightmare. Fearing the worst, he staggered into the lakefront home he shared with his wife, Marilyn, and their young son, Sam. There, in the bedroom, his wife lay brutally beaten to death. She had been four months pregnant. Dr. Shepard told police he was awakened on the downstairs couch by his wife's panicked cries. When Shepard rushed to help her, he was attacked by a tall intruder. The resulting fistfight ranged from room to room and ultimately spilled onto the beach. There, the doctor was dealt a knockout blow to the neck. A bag of the Shepard's jewelry was found near the house, suggesting that the couple had interrupted a burglary. But the police work was soon overshadowed by rampant speculation. In the rush to justice, the shadowy intruder was forgotten. Sam Shepard became the only suspect. But a few people refused to believe Shepard was guilty and were determined to prove his innocence decades later.
In the early 1990s, Cleveland attorney Terry Gilbert began studying the case and felt that Shepard was railroaded by a cursory look at the evidence. Dr. Sam Gerber, the coroner, had concluded within an hour or two after being at the crime scene that they had their man and it was Dr. Shepard. It was a death by domestic homicide. A trail of nearly 60 drops of blood led through the house. These were checked to ascertain they were human, but nothing more could be done with them. Forensic DNA analysis was 30 years away. Some of the blood stains on the cellar stairs were overlooked for decades. Since Dr. Shepard had no open wounds, police assumed this blood trail fell from the murder weapon clutched in his hand. Forced entry marks on the door to the basement were never entered as evidence. Despite obvious signs an intruder had penetrated the house, Dr. Shepard was arrested for killing his wife. The coroner staged a public inquest. Dr. Shepard was grilled on live television for five hours without his attorney. The media grabbed hold of it and sensationalized this murder. Uh, the Cleveland Press, through editor Louis Seltzer, uh, every day ran articles about solving the Shepard case. Why is Dr. Shepard not indicted? Why is he not in jail? Cartoons showing him running through the house with a, some kind of a murder weapon dripping blood. Local officials hurried to close the high-profile case. The trial began just two months after Shepard's arrest. The coroner testified that the blood found throughout the house was human. It was assumed that it came from the victim. The prosecution argued that the doctor had faked his own neck injury. The jewelry bag was also presented as phony evidence of burglary. It was just a complete travesty of justice in terms of how that trial uh, emerged during that time and uh, he was convicted. It was a foregone conclusion. He did not have a chance. We, the jury in this case, being duly impaneled and sworn, do find the defendant, Sam H. Shepard, not guilty of murder in the first degree, but guilty of murder in the second degree. Dr. Shepard was sentenced to 35 years in prison. But his family challenged the verdict, refusing to give up. A month after the conviction, they brought in forensic expert Leland Kirk to examine the blood spatters in the house. His analysis of several stains in the bedroom undermined the state's argument. Two blood stains larger than the spatters in the bedroom stood out to investigators. Their size and round shape suggested a puncture wound. The victim may have bitten her attacker. In Kirk's view, evidence strongly indicated a third person was at the scene. But the court wouldn't hear a word of it. In 1959, five years after the murder, the case took a strange twist. Cleveland handyman Richard Eberling was arrested for robbing a home where he worked. And police found among his spoils one of Marilyn Shepard's diamond rings. At his interrogation, Eberling, who resembled the man Shepard and witnesses described, unwittingly volunteered some incriminating information. He said he had cut himself at the Shepard's house the week of the murder, which would explain any strange blood found there. But he couldn't have known that investigators had questioned the blood stains. It sounded like a killer's alibi. Even so, the county prosecutor refused to look at this new evidence. On July 16, 1964, a federal district court ruled that Shepard was denied a fair trial. After serving 10 years in prison, he was released and granted a retrial. Evidence that was ignored, misread, or suppressed would finally be seen. For his second trial in 1966, two years after his release, Dr. Shepard had rising legal star F. Lee Bailey handling his defense. 
Well, how do you explain his conviction in the first place? Uh, it was a result, according to Judge Weinman, and in my opinion, of mass hysteria generated by an overzealous press. Were you in on the case at the beginning? No, I've only been a lawyer for four years. He's been in jail for ten. Bailey eroded the prosecution's case point by point. After years of neglect, the forced entry marks on the cellar door were entered as evidence. Bailey also argued that traces of a possible intruder were lost when the victim's body was prematurely washed by the coroner. Finally, a doctor testified that the fractured vertebra in Shepard's neck could not have been self-inflicted. Twelve years after the murder, the focus of the case switched to the mysterious intruder. In the retrial of convicted killer Sam Shepard, the discoveries of forensic expert Leland Kirk were finally going to be heard. Kirk testified that one blood drop on the closet door came from a puncture wound. The victim had died of blunt trauma, ruling her out as the source of the stain. But a re-examination of the autopsy record showed that her teeth had all the signs of inflicting a single powerful bite just before she died. Dr. Shepard showed no such wound. After a dozen years, the phantom attacker was taking on human form. Kirk's road to the truth was a trail of blood. Any forensic scientist even then would have told you that blood, as soon as it hits the air, dries and coagulates. The blood could not have dripped from a weapon long enough to have made the trail. These were all of equal size, which indicates that it came from an oozing wound. And none of this was looked into in 1954. Though the victim was forever silenced, the evidence was speaking out. The second trial lasted three weeks. F. Lee Bailey had stirred a reasonable doubt in the minds of the jury. On November 16, 1966, Sam Shepard was acquitted of killing his wife. But no one reopened the investigation into who had committed the murder. Potential suspects like Richard Eberling continued to be ignored. There was one reason. Many still felt Shepard was the killer, but that he'd been released on technicalities. Though the bloodstains gave him his freedom, they still smeared his reputation. He couldn't revive his medical practice. Just six years after his release, and after a failed second marriage, Dr. Shepard died of the effects of alcoholism. Through all the turmoil, Dr. Shepard's surviving son, Sam, lived quietly out of the spotlight. But in 1989, Richard Eberling, the Cleveland handyman and burglar, wrote to him from prison. Eberling was jailed for forging a woman's will and then beating her to death for the million dollar inheritance. Sam met with Eberling. The convict shared little known facts about the Shepard case. Sam wanted another trial to prove that Eberling was Marilyn Shepard's killer. At this point, Terry Gilbert sued the state of Ohio for Dr. Shepard's wrongful imprisonment. After his release, Shepard had sought no damages for the loss of his freedom. Forty years after the crime, his family hoped to prove the doctor's innocence by unlocking the secrets hidden in a drop of blood. The bloodstain evidence was passed to Dr. Mohammed Tahir, DNA analyst at the Indianapolis Marion County Forensic Services Agency. And the actual challenge was not the DNA analysis because this work we do every day. Uh, and the only challenge in this case was because the evidence was very minimum, very old. For comparison, Dr. Tahir needed a standard DNA profile from both the victim and Dr. Shepard. This way, if he found a third genetic profile in the decades-old bloodstains, he would know it belonged to the intruder. Dr. Tahir found a clean DNA profile for the victim 
in hairs plucked from her deathbed 40 years before. Though Shepard had died 18 years after his wife, a sample of his DNA seemed as elusive as the killer. Without this forensic key, the case to clear Dr. Shepard's name was stalled. Then the doctor's son thought he had a first-class source of his father's genetic material. He presented some love letters that his father had sent his mother when they were courting in 1943. Dr. Shepard's DNA might still be in the saliva mixed with the glue on the envelopes and stamps. But over the decades, the envelopes had been handled by too many people. Any DNA found on them was tainted and unusable. Once again, the case bogged down. There was still one place left to search for the doctor's DNA, his grave. Hounded in life, even death could offer Shepard no peace. In 1996, an order for his exhumation was granted. On the headstone were the letters VQP, standing for the Latin meaning, he who endures, conquers. Perhaps after nearly half a century, Dr. Shepard would finally be vindicated. Dr. Tahir was able to extract a completely clean DNA profile from one of Shepard's teeth after 24 years in the grave. But for comparison, he needed evidence taken from the crime scene. Dr. Tahir performed DNA tests on the bloody pants Shepard had worn the night of the murder. While he waited for those results, he processed two other vital clues. The first was the mysterious blood drop that Dr. Kirk had collected from the closet door back in 1955. The second was a blood-stained wood chip Sam had salvaged from a cellar stair tread before his childhood home was torn down in 1993. The results of Dr. Tahir's analysis became the new backbone of the case there was a third person's DNA in the stains, not Dr. Shepard's and not the victim's. The mysterious intruder was no longer a product of Shepard's imagination. He was flesh and blood. But who was the third man? Attorney Terry Gilbert thought he knew where to begin his search. The imprisoned Richard Everling was required to give a sample of his blood for comparison. Dr. Tahir found that the convict's DNA could not be excluded from the blood stain on the wood chip or on the pants. The test results were 16,000 to 1 in favor that the strange blood stain in the house was Everling's. But those odds weren't good enough. The courts require a certainty of millions to 1 for a conviction. And when Everling heard his DNA was linked to the bloody stair, he reminded investigators of his alibi, that he had cut his hand at the shepherd's home shortly before the murder. Forty years after the fact, Everling knew there was no one to dispute his story. Because the DNA evidence was inconclusive, the truth about the murder might never come out. Time was conspiring to hide the killer's name. Many people involved in the case had long since died. A private detective agency volunteered to locate any surviving witnesses. After months of searching, they found Vern Lund and Ed Wilbert, two other Cleveland handymen who had known Richard Everling. They remembered that Marilyn Shepard had once caught Everling robbing her home. When the victim was murdered, they knew Everling had the motive. And this prompted one more recollection. Everling was out sick the week before the murder. He could not have bled at the shepherd's house as he claimed. Everling's alibi was shattered. When all the evidence was held up to the light, the events of that tragic night so long ago came into focus. The victim screamed when she found an intruder in her room. Dr. Shepard rushed to her aid, 
but was knocked unconscious. The intruder tried to finish ransacking the house, bleeding from a wound all the while. When Shepard accosted the killer again, the fight carried on to the beach. There, the doctor was struck so hard, a vertebra was fractured. But broken bones mean little compared to broken lives. It took forensic science 42 years to put the pieces back together. The forensic evidence that we uncovered in 96 was approximately 100 pieces of evidence. It excludes Dr. Shepard as the attacker and points to a very likely suspect named Richard Eberling. Eberling has denied that he's the killer, but in interviews over and over again, he has said things about I, I the case from uh, that uh, only the uh, murderer would say. And this is an open case. It's still unsolved, technically. With each new clue, Eberling's shadow cast a longer pall over the case. But he died in July 1998, keeping his secrets forever. Forensic evidence is only as revealing as the experts who study it. The positive identity of Marilyn Shepard's killer remains a mystery. But thanks to a clear-eyed look at the clues, at least Dr. Shepard was able to convince his son of his innocence from beyond the grave. Assumptions at the crime scene can shape or distort an investigation. To clear a suspect, investigators must first believe he's innocent and then prove it scientifically. On July 6, 1984, the Platte County, Wyoming Sheriff's Office received a frantic call from Martin Frias. In a mix of Spanish and English, he told police that there had been a shooting. He could not give clear directions to the scene. Since Frias and the officers both knew a certain cafe in neighboring Wheatland, they met there. Frias guided officers to the trailer he shared with his girlfriend, Ernestine Perea. A grim scene awaited them inside. Perea's body lay face up on the floor. She had a wound in her abdomen. Frias's 300 Magnum rifle lay close beside her. Police found two bullet fragments lodged in the blood-spattered wall behind the body. Frias said he'd heard a muffled thump before he went to bed. Thinking it was merely Perea hurling shoes in one of her temper tantrums, he went to sleep. Hours later, when Frias awoke, he discovered the truth. His stormy relationship was over. Suicide was the initial ruling. After detectives interviewed Frias, he was released. Then a coroner examined the victim's remains more closely. The bullet wound in the lumbar region was small, like an entry wound. Police felt it was impossible for the victim to shoot herself in the back with a rifle. All the clues now pointed to homicide. But not everyone was convinced that Frias was a murderer. Four days after the death of Ernestine Perea, Martin Frias was arrested and charged with his girlfriend's murder. Frias's attorney, Robert Moxley, believed in his client's innocence from the beginning. When she was killed and they didn't 
have the scenario of her being shot in the back pat in their minds yet, they turned him loose. Uh, he had no real ties to the community. He'd been there a long time, but he was an illegal alien from Mexico. He didn't leave. He could have just disappeared and never been seen again. But at trial, the state's forensic evidence was more compelling than Frias's cooperation with police. It even outweighed the fact that though Frias had a severely injured arm, he had somehow managed to load, cock, and fire an unwieldy weapon that required two good hands. And given Frias's injury, the victim could have defended herself. But none of this mattered at the trial. According to the state's forensic tests, the victim's blouse showed no gunshot residue. Clearly, she had been shot from a distance. A medical examiner confirmed that the clean-edged wound in the victim's back marked where the fatal bullet had struck her. According to the medical examiner, the bullet had then passed through her body, fragmented, and exited her abdomen, leaving a much larger wound with uneven edges. To police, the conclusion was obvious. And so it was a circumstantial evidence case. If she was shot in the back, and if he was there, if his fingerprints were on the gun, well, then they could make a case that he had done it. The jury agreed. Martin Frias was convicted of the second degree murder of Ernestine Perea. He was sentenced to 25 to 35 years in prison. Moxley appealed the verdict. He believed the forensic evidence had not been fairly explored. Wyoming law had not allowed him to call his own experts in the case. He'd had to use the same experts as the prosecution. At the time, the public defenders were required to rely on the state crime lab to be their neutral expert while they were still the neutral expert, quote unquote, that was making the prosecution case for the prosecution. Moxley felt this biased the analysis of the evidence against the defendant. Over the next year and a half, he and his assistant, Walter Carroll, fought their way through the courts to have Martin Frias retried. In order to make the case for retrial, Moxley brought on the best experts in the business. He had the victim's wound evidence re-examined by Dr. Vincent DeMaio, the chief medical examiner of Bexar County, Texas. Dr. DeMaio was the foremost expert on high-velocity rifle gunshot wounds. And I found out that he was going to be lecturing in Cheyenne. So I jumped in my car and went to his hotel in Cheyenne and cornered him with these autopsy photos. He took really one look at those autopsy photos. He held them out like this, and he held them up to his nose, and he says, that's a contact wound. And that's about how long it took him to know that that's what we had. A contact wound results when a gun is fired with the muzzle pressed against the target. Dr. DeMaio's impromptu analysis of the photo bucked the state's evidence in the first trial. But to an expert, the explanation was simple. When the hot gases are propelling a bullet down the barrel of a gun, it is compressing the air in front of it. The last few inches of the bullet's travel outside the barrel is preceded by this air which is compressed so hard that it's like a knife and it goes in first, then the bullet goes in, then liters and liters and liters and liters of hot gas follow the bullet. This, is the button this hot gas had violently expanded the victim's abdominal cavity to the point of tearing her jeans and snapping off the top pants button. The state's original view of the evidence was backwards. The bullet first struck the abdomen, not the back. Though it was still possible the victim had been murdered, a contact wound in her front recalled the original scenario. Ernestine Perea could have taken her own life. But only new tests would confirm this radical take on old evidence. The victim's remains had long since been buried, but police still had her autopsy x-rays and the blouse she'd worn when she died. When DeMaio's findings were presented to the Wyoming Supreme Court, the case was reopened. Martin Frias was granted a retrial. 
In preparation for the new trial, along with DeMaio, Moxley brought in Robert Lance, director of the Rocky Mountain Instrumental Laboratories in Fort Collins, Colorado, to examine the case. Mr. Moxley had asked me for my opinion, too, as far as whether or not it was at all likely that the bullet had come into her backbone from the front or from the back. After all, it's impossible to shoot yourself in the back, or at least very difficult. And so he first asked me that. I looked at the x-rays and said, this simply doesn't seem right. But no side view x-rays of the victim's torso had been taken in the original autopsy. And Lance couldn't conclusively tell from frontal x-rays which direction the bullet had traveled. For now, he had to focus on the blouse. With a stereo light microscope, Lance observed that the fabric around the bullet hole in the front of the blouse was scorched and melted. This indicated a point-blank discharge of the weapon, but from the front, not the back. Next, Lance studied the gunshot residue on the blouse. Its distribution would tell him whether or not the gun was fired at close range. When the muzzle is close to the target, the residue saturates a very small area. At longer range, the residue area expands, but starts to thin out. I tested the overall cloth using what's called rhodazonic acid. The rhodazonic acid is very useful to uh, give me a pattern of the gunshot residue so that I can make an estimate of what the firing distance was and to see whether or not there is more gunshot residue on the front of the shirt or on the back of the shirt. He placed acid-treated paper over the inside and outside of the large bullet hole in the front of the blouse. The hot iron made the acid turn any gunshot residue on the paper bright purple. The prosecution in the first trial had claimed the victim was shot at a distance. To Dr. Lance, the evidence told a different story. And this shows us very easily the pattern so that we could see that there was a great deal of gunshot residue in a very tight mark around the hole and relatively little, even a short distance away. Once again, the forensic evidence pointed to a very close range shooting. If the victim had been shot from the front, she had seen death's approach. The question remained whether she'd welcomed it. In the retrial of Martin Frias, forensic gunshot analyst Robert Lance was wiping the defendant's slate clean with the victim's own blouse. But more rigorous tests were still needed to confirm that the victim was shot from the front. No ordinary microscope would be up to the task. To find the truth, Lance placed samples of the blouse in a scanning electron microscope to analyze the gunshot residue more closely. He discovered that the concentration of the residue decreased as the microscope panned from the front of the blouse to the back. That suggested a frontal entrance wound. The new defense was almost ready. But Moxley wanted to build the strongest case possible for his client's second trial. A blood spatter expert proved that Perea was seated on the floor when she was struck from the front. Of the wall where the blood splatters were. A ballistics test proved that the slug had expended its energy before striking the spine, breaking up, and exiting the body, again suggesting front entry. Medical records showed that the victim had been hospitalized for attempted suicide several times in the past and Perea's fingerprints on the gun were oriented as if she'd held it upside down, thus bringing the trigger within reach. The new evidence was strong 
but Moxley was determined to add the victim's own testimony to the new trial. We got the family's permission to exhume the body, and we uh, did another autopsy. We had Dr. Eckert come to participate in the autopsy, and for the first time they did lateral x-rays. The original pathologist had not done x-rays except from the front, and you couldn't tell the bullet direction from the x-rays. The side x-rays showed bullet fragments and fragments of vertebrae that had been pushed between the victim's spine and the skin of her back. Only a bullet speeding through from the front could have left this kind of damage in its wake. When all the parts of the puzzle were fitted together, a picture of the victim's last night became clear. After an argument with his girlfriend, Martin Frias fell asleep in another room. Anger, depression, and a high blood alcohol level drove Ernestine Perea to make a final suicide attempt. She sat on the floor with the rifle resting on her extended legs. But the instant her troubles ended was the very moment her boyfriend's nightmare began. We convincingly proved just exactly how Ernestine committed suicide. We showed the pathology evidence, we showed the blood splatter evidence, we showed the gunshot residue evidence. There weren't any questions to be answered by the time we were done with our forensic evidence. Open door, please. Ultimately, the new x-ray evidence from the victim's grave clinched the case. In Martin Frias' second trial, the jury needed only an hour and 45 minutes to find him not guilty. After serving two years and 10 days in prison for a crime he didn't commit, he was finally set free. Exhumations are an investigator's last resort. The forensic evidence taken from the grave can either acquit or convict. On the rainy night of October 19, 1983, a couple driving on a lonely road in St. Charles County, Missouri, were the first on the scene of a single vehicle accident. The car was abandoned, but the engine was still running. When the Good Samaritan tried to turn the car off, he found blood smears on the seat. Then he saw a woman lying in the shadows beneath the dashboard. She was barely breathing. Police from the St. Charles County Sheriff's Department noted the heavy odor of gasoline throughout the car. The threat of fire made them hurry to pull the victim to safety. When the woman's blonde wig slipped to one side, rescuers saw just how badly she was hurt. Detective Ed Copeland feared for her life. At that point, while I was down in the car, I could feel that the back of her head had uh, trauma to it, or it, was, it just didn't feel right, um, like a skull should feel. As the woman was rushed to the hospital, the car's registration was traced. It belonged to Jim Williams, a successful electrical contractor. Police phoned Williams, then drove to his home to inform him of his wife's accident. They found him sitting in the rain, waiting for them. At the hospital, doctors told Williams and his youngest son that Sharon wouldn't survive her massive head injuries. Jim Williams signed the forms allowing his wife's removal from life support. She died later that day. Jim's friend, Joanne Notice, tried to console him. Then, three months after the accident, their roles were reversed when her own marriage hit the rocks. After a bitter quarrel, Joanne's husband, Walter Notice, a band singer, stormed out into the cold December night wearing only a blue warm-up suit. Hours passed. 
but he didn't come home. Joanne Noteis told police he'd run off. She suspected he was having an affair. But Captain Wes Simcox of the St. Charles County Sheriff's Department said Walter Noteis's absence didn't seem planned. It was extremely bad weather. It was very cold. There was snow on the ground. Uh, Walter was not dressed for uh, that type of weather, and she was concerned about his uh, well-being. Walter Noteis didn't return that night. The next day, Joanne Noteis and Jim Williams broke into her husband's briefcase, seeking clues to his whereabouts. Joanne Noteis's suspicions were confirmed in living color. The briefcase held steamy photos of her husband in the arms of his backup singer. A group of friends was organized to search for Walter. Jim Williams volunteered to scout the parking lots at the airport. There he found Walter's car. He drove it back to the Notice house before he told police of the discovery. Joanne Notice was disturbed, and so was any trace evidence that might have been left in the vehicle. Though police appreciated Jim Williams' zeal, they were also suspicious of it. Captain Simcox felt that Jim Williams' kindness to the missing man's wife seemed to overreach the bounds of friendship. The evening after Walter's disappearance, uh, Jim stayed at Walter's home with Joanne. Um, and that's something you just do not do, friend or not. Um, there were several other things where there had been relationships between Jim and Joanne, a uh, neighbor saying that they'd had what appeared to be a love affair going. Defying the ugly rumors, Williams continued to aid his friend in her time of trouble. He helped her search the truck the band toured in. If Walter Noteis had deserted his wife, she'd need bank records or securities he might have stashed there. But in the search for money, Joanne came up empty-handed. In the search for Walter, the police had no better luck. New Year's Eve came and went, with Walter Noteis missing his band's best playing gig of the year. He needed the money. Police thought he would have shown up if he were able. None of Walter's friends or band members or family members could verify that, that in fact, uh, he had left the country or the state or had gone somewhere. So it was our opinion that, uh, that foul play was involved, but here again, we couldn't find anybody. Police stepped up the investigation of Jim Williams. They learned that just two weeks after Walter's disappearance, he was making plans to sell his house and move in with Joanne Noteis. Detectives questioned Jim Williams' children. His youngest son, Brett, still lived nearby. He told police he thought it odd when his father ordered a flower box built in the dead of winter at the house he was trying to sell. But the young man told police he had gotten an even more disturbing surprise. One night, shortly after the death of his mother, Brett Williams went out with his fiancée. His father and Joanne Noteis came along. Brett was upset to see his mother's favorite bracelet on Joanne's wrist. Jim Williams was getting on with his life at a breakneck pace. Even more suspicious, police learned that right after Walter Noteis disappeared, his wife began canceling his singing appearances. It seemed that no one expected Walter to make a return engagement. Okay, Mr. Williams, I'm just going to ask you a few questions about uh, the night of the 20th. In the disappearance of Walter Noteis, detectives questioned Jim lives. Williams. Where he had been so helpful before, they suddenly found him reticent. When Joanne's turn came, she was still angry over her husband's desertion. 
Joanne, at, 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 during the interview, had made some comments about um, uh, her and Walter's relationship that it was not good anymore, uh, that she, in fact, wanted a divorce. Uh, she made the comment that if, in fact, Walter was gone or dead, that good riddance. Um, so she was not happy with Walter at all. Their relationship was very weak. Uh, she wanted out of the, the uh, marriage. Uh, but here again, she did not indicate that she was involved in any way with Walter's disappearance. Detectives refused to give up the search. They combed Williams' job sites and his property looking for clues. But Walter Notice was nowhere to be found. It was as if the earth had swallowed him up. In April of 1986, six months after Joanne Notice had divorced her husband, she and Jim Williams tied the knot. Neither suspected it would soon become a noose. Then a coincidence sent police down a familiar road, but with a brand new point of view. At the exact spot where Sharon Williams had fatally crashed her car, a second car plowed into the ditch. It landed at precisely the same place as the Williams car, indicating it was going the same speed. But this driver emerged without a scratch. Investigators began to rethink Sharon Williams' death. The connection between uh, the death of Sharon and the death of Walter was made when uh, one of the officers that was at the scene uh, had called me and asked me if uh, I recalled that accident and who the husband of this woman was, and, and of course it was Jim Williams. With no new clues to Walter Notice's disappearance, investigators took a closer look at Sharon Williams' fatal accident. In October of 1986, when Chief Medical Examiner Mary Case studied the accident report, she finally saw what others had missed. My opinion after reading all of that material was, I think that it is highly inconsistent, this injury that she has with the accident. I think it's very likely that she had a homicidal assault, blunt trauma to her head, someone beat on her head and caused her to die. This meant the accident might have been staged, but Case couldn't prove it based on the old report. There wasn't enough to implicate a suspect. By this time, the only concrete evidence lay at the bottom of Sharon Williams' grave. In April of 1987, almost four years after Sharon Williams was buried, her remains were exhumed and re-autopsied. The body was very well preserved, and, and uh, uh, after the autopsy, I made the, um, the diagnosis that her cause of death was the head injury, a massive craniocerebral trauma, and that the manner of death was a homicide. Dr. Case's suspicions were confirmed. The accident was now a murder, and Jim Williams was the prime suspect. His rush into Joanne Notice's arms further implicated him in Walter Notice's disappearance. But police still needed a body to prove it. Pursuing any lead, they interviewed Jim Williams' oldest son, Jim Jr. Estranged from his father, he was jailed in Florida for armed robbery. But for an early release, he was willing to talk. Hey, Jimmy, how you doing? You need to come on out here? Though detectives refused to deal, Jim dropped hints about a well behind his father's old house. Police hadn't seen a well, but they remembered the large planter. Detectives returned to the suspect's former home. There, they served a search warrant and examined the flower box that Jim Williams had commissioned four years earlier. As police dismantled the planter, they broke open the case. The new owners of the house had no idea they also held a mortgage on a burial plot. We got out there, we brought several investigators with us and uh, began uh, the task of taking apart uh, flower box that had been placed over the top of the cistern. Uh, once the lid was removed 
from the cistern. Uh, it was amazing to us that uh, the body of Walter Scott was floating on top of uh, the water. The body was still clothed in a blue jogging suit. Only now, it wore rope restraints and a bullet hole. Dr. Case made a positive identification. The murdered singer had been found. The x-rays revealed the betrayal. Without even doing an autopsy, you know this is a homicidal death. He didn't bind himself up and get in there and die either from natural, accidental, or suicidal causes. Somebody did this to him. An autopsy confirmed that the victim had been shot once in the back. Though police had suspected foul play almost from the beginning, forensic science uncovered the entire murderous scheme. Investigators believe that in October of 1983, Jim Williams bludgeoned his wife with a pipe or a crowbar. He then drove her to the country road where he staged the wreck. After he doused the car with gasoline, he started a small fire, hoping to incinerate the evidence. Then he left her for dead, but the rain put a damper on his plan. Though Williams failed to kill his wife with a blow to her head, he finished the job with the stroke of a pen. Only two months later, he ambushed Walter Noteis. He bound the body and lowered it into the well, successfully hiding it for years. On April 10, 1987, Jim Williams was arrested for murdering both his former wife and Joanne Notice's former husband, Walter Notice. In 1992, Williams was convicted of two counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Joanne Notice got five years for hindering the prosecution. Forensic science had given the two victims a voice after years of silence. Where the housewife and the singer had been shown no mercy in life, at least in death, they received justice, measure for measure. Detectives know that a cemetery can be an important landmark on the path to the truth. While evidence gleaned there cannot raise the dead, it can sometimes grant peace of mind to those who are left behind. The scene of a murder usually yields a wealth of clues. When properly studied, they can point to a killer. Unfortunately, it's possible for a victim to take crucial evidence to the grave. Then, it's up to forensic science to resurrect the truth. I'll just look over here back at the operation. A serial killer in Texas goes undetected for 11 years. Yeah. Police that? identify a suspect, but their case must be pulled from the trash. Investigators hope new forensic techniques can establish a link among the murders and put an end to the violent rampage. In California, a missing persons case leads detectives to a secret burial ground at a Sacramento boarding house. An unlikely suspect becomes the focus of a mass murder investigation. Can science help unmask the murderer hiding behind a kindly face? Homicide investigators find that things aren't always what they appear to be. Seemingly insignificant clues may expose a pattern and put police on the trail of a killer whose compulsion is to kill again. <laughs>
December 21st, 1984, in Wichita Falls, Texas, Lisa Boone returned home from her job at a local hospital and found herself locked out. Lisa asked her landlady to unlock the apartment. She'd given her keys to Terry Sims, a friend and co-worker who was spending the night. But Terry wasn't answering the door. Inside, the women found the apartment had been ransacked. Lisa called out to Terry, but got no response. Terry, right in here. Oh, Terry. The landlady Terry. noticed blood on the floor and followed the trail. It led to Terry Sims' body. Officers from the Wichita Falls Police Department responded to the scene. Upstairs, they found the 20-year-old victim dead on the bathroom floor. She was nude, except for socks. Her hands had been tied behind her back. Police processed the scene, looking for any clue that might identify the killer. They collected blood samples, a pair of white tennis shoes with the laces still tied, and a woman's hospital uniform. They also recovered a blood-stained bedspread and sheets. At the police station, Lisa told detectives that she and Terry Sims left Thank the hospital together in. after working the 3 to 11 shift. She explained that she was also a part-time student at Midwestern State University and had an exam the next day. Terry was going to stay the night at Lisa's apartment to help her study in the morning. But Lisa said the hospital was short-staffed that night, so she volunteered for an extra shift. She dropped her friend off at the apartment around 12.30, gave Terry her keys, and returned to work. Lisa told police she'd arrived back home around 7 a.m. and knocked on the door. She had no idea who could have murdered her friend. An autopsy was performed on Terry Sims, and cause of death was determined to be multiple stab wounds to the chest and back. While there was no sign of forcible rape, biological evidence was collected from the victim's body. Excuse me, detective. Most murder victims know their killers, so Wichita Falls Police began interviewing Terry Sims' family and friends. They quickly focused on her ex-boyfriend. He denied involvement. Investigators had little evidence against him, but they had a new forensic tool in their arsenal. In 1984, DNA profiling was in its infancy and held the potential to link a killer to his crime through biological evidence left at the scene but large amounts of evidence were needed to successfully perform the tests. Hoping samples recovered in Terry Sims' case might identify her murderer, police submitted them to the Gene Screen Lab in Dallas. But their hopes were soon dashed. There wasn't enough material for DNA testing. With no hard evidence linking a suspect to the murder, the investigation stalled and the case remained unsolved. On February 15, 1985, two months after Terry Sims was found murdered, an electric company employee was working on a transformer just outside the Wichita Falls city limits. He made a horrifying discovery. He stumbled upon a woman's body. called 911. Deputies from the Archer County Sheriff's Department arrived at the scene. 
In the woods, they found the victim. Nearby, they recovered a leather jacket, a blood-stained nurse's uniform, and a pair of sneakers with the laces still tied. A search of police databases turned up a missing person fitting the victim's description. An autopsy confirmed her identity as Tony Gibbs, a 23-year-old nurse from Wichita Falls, reported missing by her brother a month earlier. The pathologist determined that she died from stab wounds to the chest and abdomen. Biological evidence was collected from the victim's body. Archer County investigators developed several suspects. They soon focused on a man named Danny Wayne Laughlin. He was the last person seen with Tony Gibbs. He had also been held on suspicion of rape in Kansas City, Missouri, less than a year before. Laughlin denied killing Tony Gibbs, but three separate polygraph tests suggested deception. At investigator's request, he provided blood and hair samples for DNA testing. Though the results were inconclusive, police believed they had the right man. Laughlin stood trial for the murder of Tony Gibbs. The jury was unable to reach a verdict. A mistrial was declared. Laughlin was never tried again. The Gibbs case remained open. On October 10, 1985, a maintenance worker was cutting grass alongside a road in Wichita County. In the overgrowth, he discovered a woman's body. He called the Wichita County Sheriff's Department. When deputies responded, they found the body of a woman, nude except for one sock. There were no clues as to the victim's identity. Police searched the surrounding area and found her clothing nearby. They also recovered a pair of sneakers with the laces tied. An autopsy was performed, but advanced decomposition made it difficult to determine how the woman died. Based on available evidence, however, the medical examiner concluded the cause of death to be undetermined homicidal violence. Wichita County Sheriff's deputies determined that the victim fit the description of a woman reported missing a month earlier. She was identified as 21-year-old Ellen Blau. They interviewed two suspects who had been with her the night she was last seen. But deputies had insufficient evidence to charge them. After several months, the case remained unsolved. While the three cases were investigated by different law enforcement agencies, they all fell under the jurisdiction of the Wichita County District Attorney's Office. Barry Maka had recently been elected district attorney and took over just days after Terry Sims' murder. The unsolved murders haunted him. The absolute terror that they went through in the final minutes of their lives motivated me to find the person responsible for their deaths. Hello. But investigators in each of the cases had exhausted all their leads, and there was nothing more Maka could do. More than a decade would pass before there was a break in the unsolved murders. By 1996, more than 11 years had passed since the murders of Terry Sims, Tony Gibbs, and Ellen Blau in Texas. Police still had no viable suspects in any of the murders. 
but improved forensic procedures prompted the Wichita County District Attorney to request a re-examination of the evidence from two of the three murders. Some of the evidence was sent to Glenn Unash, a latent print examiner at the Texas Department of Public Safety Crime Lab in Austin. He found a partial print on a sneaker recovered from the Terry Sims murder scene that had gone undetected. It didn't belong to Terry Sims. However, there was insufficient detail to make a comprehensive analysis. Because blood will darken as it absorbs the light, Unash hoped more ridge characteristics would emerge under laser light. He was disappointed. There was one more option, a dye staining technique. But there was a risk involved. The dye staining technique could possibly destroy what is there, so uh, the print was photographed prior to that. Once I got that photograph back, I examined it to make sure it re I recorded all the characteristics. Yunash was now ready to try the dye staining process. He saturated the print with amino black, which reacts to proteins in blood and turns them dark blue or black. But the process didn't develop any further ridge detail. The evidence enhancement he had hoped for eluded him. Over the next three years, he examined a series of suspect prints provided by the Wichita County District Attorney's Office and compared them to the one found on Terry Sims' sneaker. I did not identify any of the suspects that they had sent me. I uh, reported to them that uh, the print appears to be partial second, third joint or another area of the palm. They started sending me in some palm prints. I made those comparisons. I still did not identify the print. At the same time, DNA testing of the biological samples from the Sims and Gibbs cases was again underway at GeneScreen in Dallas. A new technology, PCR analysis, could provide forensic scientist Judy Floyd with more conclusive results than previous tests. The requirements were not as stringent and therefore we were able to use this very old, very degraded DNA and uh, obtain a genetic profile of the perpetrator. The new DNA process eliminated all previous suspects, including Danny Wayne Laughlin, who had stood trial for the murder of Tony Gibbs a decade earlier. But it did turn up a startling piece of evidence. Biological samples recovered from both victims came from the same individual. Emerging technology and improved forensics had linked two apparently unrelated cases. Now there was evidence a serial killer had claimed the lives of Terry Sims and Tony Gibbs. District Attorney Barry Maka wondered if some of the other unsolved cases were related. He began taking a closer look at those files. One caught his attention that of Ellen Blau. Maka noted that circumstances of her murder were similar to the Sims and Gibbs homicides. Down to the sneakers, laces still tied, found by her nude body. On January 12, 1999, Maka asked his investigator, John Little, to review the three cases and try to develop a suspect. He also gave Little a possible lead. Though the victims had been discovered in three different police jurisdictions, they all lived within a relatively small geographical area. Because of the close proximity, I felt that the person responsible for their deaths had some connection to that neighborhood. And so I emphasized that to John and asked him to review the files and, and see if he could establish anyone with a connection um, to the neighborhood that may be involved in, in the cases. Little began by probing for common threads among the women. It didn't take him long to find them. He noticed that they all shared several physical characteristics. All the victims were around the same age, pretty much the same build. They're, they were all around five foot tall, not much taller. They all 
weighed 120 pounds or less. They all seem to have pretty much the same features. A distinct pattern was emerging, suggesting all three women had been killed by the same person. Then he found a name in the Ellen Blau file, a man named Farian Wardrip. While in custody on a murder charge back in 1986, Wardrip had told police that he knew Blau. It meant nothing to the police at the time. Little wondered if it meant anything now. He learned Wardrip had worked as an orderly at the same hospital as Tony Gibbs. And records showed that he had left that job four days after the first victim, Terry Sims, was found murdered. As investigators dug deeper, they uncovered more connections between Wardrip and the three women. He had lived in an apartment downstairs from Ellen Blau. That apartment was two blocks from the residence where Terry Sims was murdered. When Ellen Blau was murdered, Wardrip no longer lived at her apartment complex. He had moved to a residence across the street from the sub shop where she worked. Authorities had placed Wardrip in the neighborhood and established links between him and the victims. They were a long way from proving murder, but now they felt they were finally on the right track. A background check confirmed that Wardrip was a convicted murderer. He had confessed to killing a Wichita Falls woman in 1986. According to the records, he'd fled to Galveston, but turned himself in to police there. Sentenced to 35 years in prison, Wardrip had been paroled in 1997. During the 11 years he was incarcerated, there were no murders in Wichita Falls that were similar to those of Sims, Gibbs, or Blau and I felt like he was a very strong suspect. But the only way to find out for sure if he was the one responsible for these murders or not was to obtain a DNA sample. Although circumstantial evidence pointed to Wardrip, it wasn't enough to obtain a court order to force him to provide DNA samples. Maka and Little decided to try to collect them surreptitiously. Their plan would require surveillance. Investigators contacted Wardrip's parole officer for information. So where's he going? They learned that Wardrip lived in nearby Olney, Texas, where he taught Sunday school and worked at a window screen company. According to the parole officer, Wardrip was being electronically monitored and was restricted to his apartment complex unless he was at work or church. Appreciate it. Take care. And that posed problems for investigators. For three days, they watched Wardrip at work behind a locked chain link fence. He seemed to be beyond their reach. But on the fourth day, they got a break. On February 5th, 1999, the fence was unlocked and Wardrip was outside. He was with his wife, eating crackers and drinking coffee from a disposable cup. tossed the cup into a trash can just inside the gate. It was the opportunity they had been waiting for. The undercover investigator approached Wardrip and asked if he could get a tobacco spit cup. Wardrip told him to help himself. With that, any evidence obtained by investigators would be admissible in a court of law. He retrieved Wardrip's cup. Investigators hoped they now had their DNA sample. But would a few drops of coffee and cracker crumbs be enough to prove murder? <laughs> 
More than a dozen years had passed since the murders of Terry Sims, Tony Gibbs, and Ellen Blau in Wichita Falls, Texas. Investigators had finally gathered physical evidence they hoped would prove Ferry and Wardrip was the killer. Now it was up to Gene Screen Lab in Dallas. Judy Floyd carefully swabbed the lip of the cup to collect Wardrip's saliva. When she compared that to DNA samples retrieved from the Sims and Gibbs murders, she was able to establish a match. And there was more. She discovered that Wardrip's profile was unique. He had not one, but four very rare markers in his genetic profile. His uh, profile was so rare that you would expect it to occur only one time in several thousand times the population of the Earth. And in effect, we were able to say that we have established identity with this particular individual to the evidence involved in Miss Sims and Miss Gibbs' case. Investigators didn't stop there. At the Texas Department of Public Safety Crime Lab, Glenn Unash compared Wardrip's fingerprints to the partial print found on Terry Sims' sneaker. They matched. Besides making a positive identification, Unash could explain much more. I can also determine how that shoe was held or uh, when that print was left on that shoe. And it was in a uh, direction that the uh, defendant held the shoe or uh, was taking the shoe off the victim's foot, somewhat similar to this, which would be consistent with pulling it off of a victim's foot. Investigators' patience and ingenuity had paid off. It was time to take Wardrip into custody. They again enlisted the cooperation of his parole officer. On the pretense of a meeting, Wardrip was summoned to the parole office on February 13, 1999. When he arrived, police arrested Ferry and Wardrip and charged him with the murder of Terry Sims. Based on the evidence, police believe Wardrip saw Terry Sims at the door of Lisa Boone's apartment. After forcing his way inside, he tied her hands behind her back, then raped and killed her. Ferry and Wardrip pled guilty to the capital murders of Terry Sims, Tony Gibbs, and Ellen Blau. He was sentenced to death in the Sims case and received life terms in each of the others. Wardrip also confessed to an additional murder. In all, he had ended the lives of five young women. In Texas, a serial killer's guilt was contained in a disposable coffee cup. But on the West Coast, police would have to dig deeper for proof of murder. On November 7, 1988, in Sacramento, California, social worker Judy Moyes contacted Sacramento police about one of her clients, 52-year-old Bert Montoya. She said Bert had disappeared from the boarding house where she'd placed him. His landlady seemed unsure about his whereabouts. Ms. Moyes told police that Dorothea Puente's boarding house was a refuge for indigent people, many with histories of alcohol and drug abuse. It seemed ideal for Bert, a street person with no place to go. He had his own room and TV and was happy there after years of living on the streets. But after a few months, Bert started saying he wanted to leave. Judy Moyes hadn't heard from Bert in three months. Mrs. Puente finally explained that Bert had gone to live with his brother in Utah. That made no sense to Judy Moyes. She knew Bert Montoya didn't have any family. 
she asked police to look into it. Officers went to interview Dorothea Puente. She seemed a gracious, grandmotherly woman, charming and eager to cooperate. She said Bert had gone to live with family in Utah. I One of the residents in the boarding house corroborated the account. I know who he is. But as the officer was leaving, the resident slipped him a note. He wanted to talk. He told police that he'd seen some strange things at the house. Bert wasn't the only one who vanished. Another tenant, Ben Fink, had two. And there were others. But their social security checks kept coming. He also described a terrible odor around the boarding house. He said he'd once worked at a mortuary and recognized the smell of death. Where, whereabouts are these holes? The police officer filed a missing persons report on Bert Montoya. Detective John Cabrera of the Sacramento Police Department was assigned the case. The name Dorothea Puente was familiar to him. She was known as a champion of the dispossessed. She was highly respected for all of her charitable things that she had done to the Hispanic community. Um, there were people that visited from other countries who came here to praise her and talk to her. And uh, she was known in the Hispanic community as Doctora, which is Spanish for doctor. Now, Detective Cabrera requested a background check on Dorothea Puente. Based on her reputation, it wasn't what he expected. He learned that the kindly grandmother was actually only 59 years old and had a criminal history of preying on the elderly. She'd been previously convicted on multiple counts of forging social security checks and had served four years in prison. For investigators, her M.O. was surprising. And she was getting these checks by putting knockout drops in these individuals' drinks. And of course, when they passed out, she took their check and signed it. Conditions of Dorothea Puente's parole prohibited her from keeping a boarding house. That gave detectives a reason to look deeper into the situation. Four days after Bert Montoya was reported missing, they met with Judy Moyes, hoping she could provide more information about the boarding house. She said most of the residents were poor, the forgotten elderly who exist on the fringes of society. But Dorothea Puente always had a place for them. And she had a reputation for treating tenants like family. Moyes claimed that several other social workers began to notice that their clients sometimes disappeared from the house, never to be seen again. Bert Montoya was the most recent. Perhaps some of the tenants had simply wandered off or family members had decided to take care of them. Investigators decided to find out. Later that morning, police met with Dorothea Puente. Although they didn't have a warrant, she graciously gave them permission to conduct a search. In one of the upstairs bedrooms, police found prescription medication, a sedative, in the name of Dorothy Miller. She was related Mrs. To Puente me. told them it belonged to a relative who had stayed with her for a while. Investigators asked if they could dig around in her backyard. Mrs. Puente not only gave them permission, she offered to get people in to dig for them. That didn't seem the action of a person with something to hide. Investigators declined her offer and began digging themselves. 
After finding nothing in three holes, they began to think they were wasting their time. But in the fourth, they found corrosive lime, often used to mask odors and speed decay. They decided to keep digging. To their surprise, they uncovered what appeared to be a human leg bone. At a boarding house for the elderly run by 59-year-old Dorothea Puente, Sacramento police uncovered human remains. We need to get uh, forensics here. Yeah. The coroner's office and a crime scene unit were dispatched to the scene. Puente agreed to accompany police to the station to make a statement. She was very cooperative and appeared genuinely shocked that bones were found in her yard. She said she had been living there for little more than a year. Perhaps the previous owner could explain the bones. But Puente's criminal past could not be ignored. Police asked her outright if she'd killed her missing tenant, 52-year-old Bert Montoya. Dorothea Puente calmly denied it. Since there was no evidence of any crime, investigators took Mrs. Puente home. The next morning, the search at the boarding house continued. As more police and excavation equipment arrived, curious onlookers and reporters began to assemble outside the house. Around 9.45, Mrs. Puente asked if she was free to go to the corner coffee shop. Since she'd been so cooperative and detectives had no proof of her involvement in any foul play, they let her go. Fifteen minutes later, at 10 a.m., forensic technicians uncovered a second body, wrapped in a tarp, buried under a cement slab. The condition of the tarp indicated that this body hadn't been underground very long. A police officer was dispatched to pick up Dorothy Puente at the coffee shop. She wasn't there. We sent people over there to find out who had seen her, if anybody had talked to her, uh, what was going on. They went over there and they had ascertained that she had uh, got into a taxi cab and drove off. Sacramento police traced the cab and learned it had taken her to the Stockton bus station, 50 miles away. There, they learned she boarded a bus to Los Angeles. Not knowing where she might be heading, investigators launched a nationwide search for Dorothea Puente. She was now wanted on suspicion of murder. At the boarding house, authorities continued digging. Their search for missing person Bert Montoya had unearthed human remains of one victim and a second buried corpse. Mindful of statements that several residents had disappeared, police feared Mrs. Puente's yard might conceal more ugly secrets. The second body had been discovered under a cement slab that seemed out of place. Now they realized that several more sheds, slabs, and planters were oddly situated. They soon discovered the reason for that. Laura Santos, deputy coroner of Sacramento County, supervised the search. Under every one of these odd seeming things like the sink, there was a body. Under the poorly poured piece of concrete, there was a body. Next to the shed that looked hastily assembled, there was a body. After three days, the dig finally came to an end. Seven bodies had been uncovered in Dorothy Puente's yard police were dealing with a mass murder. It seemed impossible that seven people could have been buried right under the neighbor's noses without anyone seeing anything 
Hoping for information or witnesses, detectives began interviewing Mrs. Puente's neighbors. It was hard to find anyone with anything negative to say about her. It was like fighting an uphill battle. The community, first of all, did not want to accept the fact that this gray-haired little woman who they loved so much and who had given so much to the community was responsible for this gruesome task of uh, putting these people in the yard. While investigators canvassed the neighborhood, the grim task of identifying the seven victims, three men and four women, was underway at the Sacramento coroner's office. All the bodies were x-rayed, then forensic pathologists performed autopsies on them. The coroner started with the victim most closely matching Bert Montoya's description. She began by carefully removing layers of wrapping and documenting each. The body, like many of the others, was wrapped in a signature way that suggested a methodical but twisted mind. Sheets wrapped with duct tape, then quilts stitched together, blankets, then more sheets, more um, tarps. I remember there were blue tarps on a couple of the cases. And then each layer would somehow be secured, either with twine or duct tape or actually stitched with thread. And then the entire bundle, perhaps, duct taped together. The wrappings concealed advanced decomposition, which made it impossible to establish a cause of death for any of the victims. But because of the circumstances, all were ruled homicide. The condition of the bodies also prevented pathologists from immediately identifying any of the victims. As Dr. Santos explains. Most people are identified by fingerprints first, next by dental records, and then by other means. Four out of the seven bodies were too decomposed to get decent fingerprints from. None of them had any teeth. So the usual methods that we make an identification could not be used. The tissue samples were sent to forensic labs for further analysis. To aid in identification efforts, investigators tried to locate people who had disappeared from the boarding house. They found the brother of 55-year-old Ben Fink, one of the tenants believed to be missing. But he told police he hadn't heard from Ben in three months. Investigators feared Ben Fink had already been found. To build their murder case against 59-year-old Dorothea Puente, police needed physical proof linking her to the victim's deaths. Investigators went through the boarding house again. They found twine, duct tape, and a coffee can with the word lie written on it. Guys, Police found dozens here. of bottles of the prescribed sedative Dalmain. That didn't seem unusual in a boarding house full of elderly people. But investigators noticed all of the Dalmain, although prescribed by several different doctors, was in Dorothea Puente's name. As details of the investigation became public, police began hearing from witnesses who helped them reconstruct an account of Dorothea Puente's daily routine. It seemed she had a penchant for pre-dawn gardening and became very angry if interrupted. They also learned that she insisted on personally collecting the mail every day, particularly at the end of the month. She was always there to get the mail because, of course, the mail had the checks. And um, she would take the checks and keep control of all the money. Investigators learned that nobody had questioned that control. Since most of the boarding house residents had drug or alcohol problems, it seemed a logical way to keep them from lapsing into their old habits. Police believe that by persuading residents to sign their monthly checks over to her, Mrs. Puente would be assured that the money would keep coming even after the tenants disappeared. In fact, 
she was getting 10 to 12 federal assistance checks each month, some for people who hadn't lived at the boarding house in years. Bank, Police believed that, uh, money was the motive for murder, but they still needed to find their suspect. Despite the manhunt, Dorothy Apuente was still at large. On November 16th, less than a week after she fled, investigators got a tip that Dorothy Apuente was at a motel in Los Angeles. An elderly man called police when he saw her picture on TV. He'd recognized her as the woman who'd struck up a conversation about his social security benefits. She wanted to know things like, you know, how much he was getting and was he taking, you know, a benefit, full benefit of receiving the money. And of course, you know, he was inquisitive, but she had told him that she knew how to raise his money allotment. Even as a fugitive, she couldn't resist the opportunity to cash in. Her greed had finally caught up with her. Dorothy Apuente was finally in custody. Though they believed they knew her motive for the murders, police had no physical evidence linking her to them. In addition, the victim's identities were still unknown. A latent print examiner was brought in. He compared known samples to fingerprints from three of the bodies. He confirmed that one of the victims was Bert Montoya. He would soon identify Ben Fink and Dorothy Miller as well. Science had made a liar of Dorothy Puente. But there remained four victims without names. Police had compiled a list of 60 people who had received social security checks at Dorothy Apuente's boarding house. They tried to track down every name on that list. They found most of the people still alive, having moved out of the house for a variety of reasons. But a few were still unaccounted for. They then assembled medical records on each missing person. The files were forwarded to the Sacramento coroner's office. There, forensic pathologists began the painstaking task of comparing x-rays of each body found in the yard to medical records from each of the missing persons. They looked for distinguishing characteristics in the records that could be linked to each victim. We did find anomalies in the bodies, abnormalities, like one person had had skull surgery and had evidence that he'd had a craniotomy. And another person had irregular characteristics of one of her clavicles and she'd also had some mandible lower jaw fractures in the past. And using that information from the bodies, we were then able to start making comparisons with the medical records we'd obtained from this list that Social Security had provided us. The victims had all finally been identified. But police were still missing a crucial piece of the puzzle. How they died. Until that question could be answered, authorities would have a hard time proving murder. They hoped a forensic toxicologist could give them answers. In November of 1988, Police investigating the murders of seven people at a Sacramento boarding house enlisted the aid of toxicologist William Phillips at the California Department of Justice. With no obvious cause of death, they hoped he would be able to determine whether drugs or poisons had ended the victims' lives. Phillips began by analyzing all seven victims' tissue samples with a radioamino acid, or RIA, test, which is sensitive to classes of drugs. The test results showed all of the samples contained the sedative flurazepam, which is used widely in Dalmain, the drug found at Dorothy Apuente's boarding house. It is a potent sedative often prescribed for the elderly. 
It was the first physical evidence linking Puente to the deaths of the seven victims. Next, Phillips subjected the samples to the tandem mass spectrometer, the only one on the west coast at the time. The apparatus uses negative ion detection to find the characteristic profile or footprint of individual drugs. Besides detecting the presence of fluorazepam or dolmane in each sample, it also measured the drug's concentration. But because the bodies had been underground for varying periods of time, those concentrations did not necessarily reflect levels present at the time of death. Some of the drug could have seeped into the ground. The drug, Dalmain, was present in all the samples, but the concentrations were so varied that no one could say whether or not the drug caused their death. But I was able to link all the samples all the tissues, the brains, the liver tissues from all these victims to Dorothea Puente. Investigators believe they had enough evidence to charge Dorothea Puente with the murder of her seven tenants. Based on the evidence, police believe she would charm residents into giving her control of their money. If they were reluctant, she would invite them into her private rooms and give them a drink laced with drugs. Afterwards, she would methodically wrap the bodies and hire men to dig holes in her backyard. During her pre-dawn gardening, the 59-year-old woman managed to bury her victims. On August 15, 1993, Dorothea Puente was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder and one count of second-degree murder. The jury was unable to reach verdicts on the other four charges. She was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Serial killers are methodical skilled at covering their tracks in order to keep killing. But even the cleverest of predators cannot avoid detection for long. Today, forensic scientists using sophisticated technology are helping police stop deadly criminals with an urge to kill again.